Uh, all right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to B3.16. Uh, uh, so I would like to introduce uh, Johannes Kruger. Uh, he's going to talk about the, delivering the perfect QGIS installation. And um, yeah, uh, that's it. I think the people we will probably still coming from the coffee break, but uh, let's start so that we are not getting uh, delayed. All right, over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. Um, let me see. This should work. Yeah, perfect. So the purpose of my talk is to show you the opportunities that QGIS offers you to kind of, I mean, if you are an organization or in a company or maybe just managing QGIS for your, for your colleagues. Um, I want to show you what kind of opportunities QGIS offers for you to customize the experience, right? So you might have some pre-configuration, some deployment options, and so on. I'm not going to look at all the menus of QGIS and tell you what's possible in there, right? That's not the point. I'm going to show you how you can give that what you configured to your users. I have a very short agenda. I will briefly talk about the QGIS application, applications. Um, we will look into profiles, which is something I didn't for years, and then at some point I realized how awesome profiles are. Kurt already mentioned them in the presentation earlier. Um, yeah, that's the main focus today. And also, I will talk about some overrides, so how you can make QGIS work differently from what you would normally get. I will focus a bit on Windows, because Linux people are smart and know better, and on Mac I have no idea but that's only a very minor point in the presentation. Of course, you know that QGIS works for Linux and Mac as well. Brief advertisement slide. I'm from Ware Group in Germany. That's also because uh, why I didn't bother to translate the slide, right? We usually um, deal with German customers or German-speaking customers. We are about 50 people, and we do services on all kinds of open source GIS pro projects and um, yeah, tools. So let's dive right into it. Um, what is QGIS actually? Um, luckily, Anita and also Kurt already talked about LTR and LR and all this kinds of version stuff. Um, I will only show you some slides about how you can install QGIS in the end and what that actually means and how you could also build a new installer yourself. Um, if you go to QGIS.org and you don't download QGIS, you have several options. Um, the main option, or the one that's most prominently advertised, although it's not the most recommended one, is the standard installer. I call it MSI because that's the, the file extension. It's a pretty simple installer. You have like five or six or seven clicks to install QGIS, um, and then you have a directory somewhere on your computer in which a QGIS version is installed. One month later, you go to the website, you see a new version, you download the installer again, you run it, you get a new version of QGIS installed. It doesn't upgrade or anything. Each time you use this installer, you get a new directory on your system. Right? So you can't just say, oh, upgrade this QGIS, but you would have to uninstall the old version, install the new version. But it's super simple, super easy, and a standard Windows um, workflow. Of course, on Linux, you would use repositories. The other installer, and it usually is kind of frightening when you first see it, is the OSG or network installer. It has a graphical interface that's very powerful, but also kind of nerdy. You have to know what you're doing in there. You can upgrade, you can downgrade, you can also run it um, without the, uh, the graphical interface and scripts. You can install much, much more than just QGIS. You can install developer versions and so on. So at first glance, this is kind of the Swiss Army knife for QGIS installation. Um, once you know it, it's easy. If you don't know it yet, it's really confusing, but it makes sense to learn it if you want to deploy QGIS, right? This is the nice opportunity to actually also upgrade an existing installation. You can run this after you installed it and say, oh, a new version is there. Let me install that, two clicks, and it runs, and it's done. What's also nice about this is that you get different options. You can decide to install proprietary libraries as well, or Kind of, kind of proprietary libraries. You can also install, for example, Python um, modules that some plugins might use. Um, and you could also 
just download everything in the first go and then take this and put it on, this, on, a, on, a, on a different system and then uh, install QJS on that system without an internet connection if you wanted. So it's very powerful, definitely. There's also other options. You could use, for example, Chocolatey or Chocolatey, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, Winget, Conda, Scoop, and so on, different portable QGIS options. Um, there's many options to install QGIS. As I said earlier, there's the decision of the flavor. So do you want a stable release or the modern release? I personally always suggest to use the more up-to-date version. I find the stable versions kind of boring. But of course, it depends on your actual use case. And you could also build your own installer, right? I showed these two Windows installers. The end result is always the same. You have some directory in which there are some files that end up being QGIS and some launcher that can actually then launch this QGIS. You could take such installation and then depending on what kind of software you use in your company or organization to roll out QGIS or to give your colleagues you could build your own installer. This might be something for a workshop maybe next year, I don't know. But yeah, the result is always the same. Somewhere on your system you have QGIS, somehow you can launch it and it's some version. It doesn't really matter, right? You could have multiple versions installed and that's all fine. What does it actually mean? Um, QGIS is an application, of course. You can start it and something gets presented in front of your face and you can use it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an app, it has some features, it can show data, it can load data, and so on. What actually happens there is that QGIS also loads a profile, right? So all the stuff that you do in QGIS, um, if you create a project, something is added to the history, if you add plugins and so on, this all gets stored in a separate directory, in a separate folder called your profile. And all your QGIS applications on your system could be multiple versions, they could be running at the same time, you could have multiple versions like Kurt already showed. Um, and you could use any kind of combination between these, right? So you could have different profiles for different use cases. So let's get into the actual meat of the implementation, which is what are these profiles actually? If you have a new installation and start QGIS, it will create a default profile already, also called default. It will install some default values. I will stop saying default now and put it into a directory called default as your profile. Um, you start that, then you start using it. As I said, changes then get stored into this profile. And you can have as many profiles as you want. Kurt said like for different clients, for example, for different projects, you could also use them for testing, for teaching, and so on. You can separate your different QGIS configurations. We will look at what that means in a moment between profiles to have them yeah, separated independent of each other. And already shown, you can choose which profile to use. Right, what does this mean? A profile is just a directory on your system and it's independent from the actual QGIS application. If you uninstall QGIS, it doesn't uninstall your profile, it still exists. You could take this profile, you could zip it, you could send it to a colleague or the other way around for deploying QGIS, right? You could pre-configure a profile, put it on the, on the user system, and they would immediately be able to start in some way that you envisioned for your company or organization. They are just simple, plain, dumb directories in which some files exist. Let's take a look at these, what's inside a profile. And I'm not going to get into too much detail here. Um, there's many, in a, new in a new profile, there's many directories that are just empty. But if QJS sees some files in them, it will use them and present them to the user. For example, layout templates or project templates. You could also pre-install fonts if you have a, a um, corporate identity a specific font, for example, to use, you could install that in a profile already if it's not installed on the system. There's different places to add functionality like models, like processing scripts, expression functions, plugins, and so on. You have, very important, the authentication database, right? So the place where actually, if you are smart and you don't store the plain text passwords in QGIS anymore, you get encrypted storage of um, authentication credentials for web services and databases and so on. 
and more. We will look at the two any files, settings, and GUI customization in a moment. But yeah, this is just a kind of scaffolding for um, configuring QGIS to your needs. Usually, you use QGIS, you don't know about this directory, whatever you save in, in settings gets up, uh, gets stored in there. But as I said, you can pre-configure that and give it to, you, to your users in the perfect way. Oops, sorry. Let's look at the main settings file. It's a file called qgis3.ini. That's a technical detail. You can just look it up in the profile somewhere. It's a human readable file, so you can use any text editor to open it. And you can see all the files. Oh, crap. Don't start the backup. Oh, you don't see it. It's okay. Um, you see, for example, all the settings that you did in the options menu, but you also see stuff like the data sources. Um, they are all stored inside this file. This file is kind of messy because it has grown over different QGIS versions, and also every plugin author invents their own way of storing their data in this file. But maybe QGIS4 fixes that, I hope. Um, here's a brief example from a, a default um, ini file. For example, you can find stuff like what should QGIS use if a new layer is in, uh, created, what kind of coordinate references coordinate reference system should be used. And we see the value EPSG 4326. If you don't like that, you could change it for your users and give them this profile. Right? You could use the options menu, or you could use a text editor in this case. Of course, and there's benefit here is you could use version control and so on on these files. The other any file is for interface customiz customization. Um, we already know that you can enable and disable panels or toolbars on QGIS or move them around, but you can also actually really disable them. You can make them um, unreachable for the users. It's not about showing and not showing them, but you can yeah, really take out this, not the code, but the functionality that displays them at all. There's a menu for that. It's kind of messy. It doesn't expose everything, but you can do st nice stuff with it. For example, you could take out these confusing options at the bottom of the map. You might know them from people who say, my map looks weird, uh, my map doesn't render anymore because they clicked on some uh, uh, rigid on there. Right? You could go into this menu, change some settings, and poof, they are gone. They can't use them anymore, and they can't be confused anymore. And this is also stored in some kind of a text file, like the other any file. So you could pre-configure this, put it in a profile, give this profile to your users, and they would be safe from danger. Right, so we have different options. I showed you this profile directory and all the directories and files in them that you could pre-populate and pre-configure. Of course, you could use a GUI and then just store the files. And I showed you some more detail on these any files, but maybe that's not enough for you. Maybe it's a bit more complex at your organization. Maybe you need to actually do stuff that QGIS doesn't offer in a convenient way. Um, but yeah, more advanced stuff. For that, you can use overrides. So what I showed earlier is just standard QGIS functionality. What I'm showing now is also standard QGIS functionality, but it offers you to do stuff that yeah, overrides QGIS um, things. One common used example is the default settings. Um, QGIS has a file where default settings are stored. So if QGIS doesn't know what to do for a certain thing, like for example, it makes a new layer, which CRS should it use, it will look in this file. It will try to find an information in this file. And you could also override that. You could have, for example, a file on your network share and tell QGIS when it launches, hey, don't look at your own, de own defaults look at this file that's stored globally in our organization for all users for our standard new layer coordinate reference system. For that, you can use this global settings override. It's a command line parameter or a um, environment variable, or you could also put it in the main profiles directory. I made a nice flowchart. Oh yeah, uh, that's important here, not the flowchart. If you use such override, you will override QGIS defaults really, right? So you should best take the version that QGIS provides already and build upon that, otherwise you might get some bad defaults. 
I made a funky flowchart, but the time is too short for that, and it's also very confusing, and I hate LibreOffice, so let's skip that. Um, other overrides. For example, you could also store all the profiles not on the local system of the user, but again, somewhere else, maybe on a network drive, maybe for some reason in your organization you want to share all your profiles between all users. It might be messy if they use it at the same time, but it's possible. You could do that with a command line option. You can also put some customization file somewhere, like I showed before. There's also a flag to say no plugins. I'm not sure what it does. If someone does, please talk to me. Um, it does not not load plugins, so you can't disable plugin loading with it. I'm not sure what it does, but it should be doing something cool, I guess. And as I said, the authentication database is kind of important nowadays, right, for, stop, um, for secure storage of authentication credentials. You can also put that on a shared network location. So all the authentication details could be in a central location for your organization. You can also kind of force the installation of additional plugins. You could specify a path somewhere on a system or, again, in the network, where QJS will look for additional plugins. QJS comes with a, bit of, with a few core plugins. It comes with maybe plugins in the user profile. And then this override would allow you to override these plugins again. So if the user installs Quick OSM, for example, but you say, oh no, this other version is important at our organization, don't use that one, you could use it. You could put it in this plugin path and make the users or force the users to load that. This does not um, disallow them from installing their own product and plugins. They would still go onto the profile. Right, now comes my favorite part. Um, you, because you can also inject code to the QJS startup process. You can provide QJS with some Python code. And at some points during QJS startup, QJS says, oh, user, do you want me to do something special here? Do you have code for me to execute? And yeah, that's very useful. You know, if you launch QGIS, you see the screen for a while, and at some point it's done. Let's look at that and see how we can add more functionality here. Of course, you could write some custom launcher, so you could put something between the user clicks and QGIS starts. You could put a batch file there that, I don't know, copies files from somewhere, sets up the proxy or whatever. Um, you have all the opportunity here to do whatever you want, right? If you control the system, you could say, hey, this is a QGS icon. It's not actually a QGS. I have a program in front of it, and afterwards you start. So you could do stuff before QGS starts. It then starts. At some point, the internal Python interpreter is initialized, and then you could jump in and use the, uh, the startup environment variable to provide QGIS with a script of code to execute. At a later stage, there's also the internal libraries are loaded and the I phase, for those of you who program in QGIS, PyQGIS, the I phase is kind of the application interface to use Python code that um, influences QGIS or that works with QGIS. At that stage, you could use a startup Py file. The start continues, plugins are loaded and so on. And another opportunity, you could also provide a command line parameter. Don't ask me why there are three different technical options and different stages. Um, but yeah, at some point, QGIS is ready. And let's look back at what you can do with these options very briefly. As I said, the launcher, you can do whatever you want with it. This PyQGIS startup thingy, I never used it. It's supposed to be useful for some very nerdy stuff. You probably won't use it as well. But the startup Py or the um, code parameter are super useful to yeah, do special stuff. In earlier versions of QJS, you could, for example, not set in the settings that you want to see the feature count for new layers displayed in the layer tree. So for one customer, for example, we said, oh, we can inject code here. Let's write something. Dear QJS, if you, if you load a new layer, please execute this code. And the code um, enabled the feature count display. So super useful. Which one of these you use, startup pi or the code um, parameter, depends on your deployment. Yeah, share tips in the QA if you have nice use cases of that. 
one minute and I will be done. Right, um, there's also some more stuff. Oh crap, my slides are bad. Let me just show everything. So there's the QGIS deployment tool belt. I'm not sure if Jean and Benoit might be in the room. No, but they are somewhere on the conference from Auslandia. This is a new project which looks super, super handy. Um, what I showed you are kind of the opportunities to how you could influence QGIS and what you could uh, change. What this tool actually does is the deployment process. So you can write rules, how profiles should be created and where they should be deployed. And it's very, very fancy and very, very nice. So check that out and talk to them during the conference. The Profile Manager plugin allows you to migrate stuff between profiles, so copy data sources over and so on. It's experimental. I will try to fix it on Wednesday, so stay tuned. Some links for you for your research, and that's it. And thanks for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Johannes. Now, questions. If you have any question, please raise your hand and I will bring the mic to you. Don't be shy. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for the nice presentation. My name is Sarkan Girgin. Um, well, the methods that you showed are, um, can be used only after you install QGIS, right? So is there a way to, to customize it before the installation, like putting some profiles by default or setting some settings before people install QGIS? Um, as I said, profiles and application are separated. So you could also install profiles before QGIS is installed. And then once QGIS starts, it will look which profiles are available and load them. So the main idea for me would be, I would think about what do my users need? What should I pre-configure for them? Then push the profile to the system and have QGIS installed as well. So they would start immediately, not with the QGIS default and profile, but maybe with different coordinate reference system or plugins and so on. So yeah, it's a separate, um, separate things on the system and at which point you install them doesn't really matter. You could also install a profile later on, it would appear for the user, or you could, of course, also override um, a profile that the user used, but best tell them about it before you do it. Yeah, thank you. All right, some more questions? Hello, thank you for the presentation. I'm Nilufar Chippa. Uh, my question regarding the profiles, I never use it, but immediately you started to talk about it. I could imagine how could I use it. I have many client and I have so many database connection or some VFS and etc. All in all, one QGIS and I'm always have to be cautious if I'm opening a QGIS project in front of another client and it shows up that, yeah. But the, um, my problem is I'm working, depending on the project, if I need a um, bigger machine, then I'm switching the computers. And what would we do with the best case to use the profile in the multiple computers? Mm. Um, depends on a lot of things. Depends on your operating system and on your organization or company. Um, in many cases nowadays, things get synchronized on a network. I showed the path for the um, default pass on Windows, for example. Where is it? Yeah, over here. So app data roaming. Um, on Sun systems, this would actually be, for example, if it's very advanced and you use some kind of Citrix and terminal servers and so on, this kind of directory would be stored somewhere on the network and be available for all your machines. So that would be the idea. Um, you could, of course, use this profile path where is it? Too many slides here. Uh, over here. Right, so you could say, my QGIS starts with a specific path in which it will look for the profiles. And if that path is on a network, you could launch it anywhere and you would always, always have access to this uh, network drive. If you had, for example, a home directory on a Z directory, or for example. Yeah, so. All right, thank you. Uh, I think we don't have time for more questions. If you want to ask, then uh, you can talk later. Um, thank you very much again, Johannes. And uh, we have a small gift from the conference uh, for you. Yeah.
Here you go. Uh, thank you very much.